that it really takes to walk in love. It's not easy to really walk in love. And today I'm going to show you that true grit is true love. And so what is grit? Well, the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary defines grit as firmness of character, an indomitable spirit. Um, the Oxford Dictionary calls grit courage and resolve, strength of character. And those are pretty good. Um, as I studied this term, I realized that grit is the perseverance and passion that pushes us towards our goal. And grit doesn't complain when things get hard, because they will. You know, grit makes the best of our current reality, even if you don't like it. Um, grit's tough. Grit's in it for the long haul. You know, grit will accomplish the task no matter how long it takes. Grit doesn't quit. Love never quits. Love never fails. You know, one thing that impressed me to learn is that both love and grit can be learned, can be taught, and can be perfected. And that those two things will change your life. Everybody who understands what love really is and what it takes to have that love will have a bettered life. And uh, Angela Duckworth, a professor from the University of Pennsylvania, who's done extensive research on the topic of grit and self-control, came up with an expanded definition of grit. And she calls it perseverance, perseverance and passion for the long-term goals. Perseverance and passion for long-term goals. Now, not all researchers agree with her, but I do. Because grit isn't just something you have just for now. It's something that, that, you, that will just keep you going, keep you grinding, keep you moving in the direction you want to go, no matter what's happening around you. No matter if all hell's breaking loose around you or within you, you just keep moving. That's grit. Some people don't have grit. They haven't developed grit. And um, I was reading these websites on this, and some of the people from Europe, they say that some of the, some of the American optimism, which they all seem to love about the Americans in Europe, they say it's also a deterrent because we want to just say be positive about everything. Whereas... We have to be pragmatic enough to realize that life isn't always positive. It's not always good stuff that happens to you. So you have to have grit to get through that, to get to the good. You know, you people who've, who've been in the military, been to battle, you know, you know that, you know this stuff. You just keep moving. Or if you're an athlete of any sort, you just keep doing it. Or a mom, you just keep momming it, you know? <laughs> you know, so uh, this makes me think of, uh, of a verse that summarizes these three traits, perseverance, passion, and the end game. And 1 Corinthians 13, 13, that's the very last verse in that chapter. I'm going to read it from the message it says, but for right now, until that completeness, we, we have three things to do to lead us towards that consummation. Trust steadily in God. Hope unswervingly. Love extravagantly. And the best of the three is love. And, and this really triggered in me what is it, what led up to this. I've read chapter 13 hundreds of times. I've heard it taught hundreds of times. And, uh, but I never thought of it in terms of the work it takes to really love. And that's what we're going to get into today. So to really love, we have to have grit. If you love yourself, you'll have grit to get through the toughest times, the temptations, the hurts, um, 
You know, I like that steady trust, unwavering hope, and a special kind of love. And that's, uh, that's the way we get things done at the level of love. It takes grit. And so um, go ahead and go to uh, 1 Corinthians 13. That's the only place we're going to be today. And uh, so love is true grit. And 1 Corinthians is all about true grit, the perseverance and passion for long-term love. The perseverance and passion for long-term love. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking about that movie True Grit. And uh, it's hard to say the word grit and not think about that. And, uh, of course, it was done twice. I should say movies. And, uh, and the title um, clearly describes the three main characters in that movie. And we're going to see from chapter 13 that grit, true grit, is the heart and motivation behind what God calls love. And the movie True Grit is a study of the determined mindset of three Americans in the Wild West who were focused on the single-minded goal of tracking down a murderer. And the hard-living, one-eyed lawman named Rooster Cogburn, the young girl Maddie Ross who hires Cogburn because of his reputation for grit, and Sergeant LeBeau, the self-disciplined Texas Ranger who, like the others, would not quit on his goal. And each member of the unlikely trio possesses a heap and helping of grit. Not grits. <laughs> Maybe that too. <laughs> What's a grit? And uh, so 1 Corinthians 13 is similar in that it's a study of the unalterable determination or determined mindset of anyone who pursues an understanding of love, life, and light. And we're going to see what it takes to really, truly love somebody else. This is the text on love. And we're going to, and, you know, we're also going to see that long-term love takes grit. Is grit. And love is deeper than a card signed with X's and O's. But it enjoys them. You see, love is higher than blown kisses and chocolate hearts. But it appreciates them. You know, love is flowers that were homegrown for you. They were handpicked for you. And they were hand-delivered just for you. It took time. It took work. It took care. You know, perseverance, passion, and a clear view of the final goal is, um, is all about love. It's all about grit. And this will make more sense in a minute. When we start reading this chapter, you'll see, wow. And 1 Corinthians, it was written, was written I think, around 57 A.D., Christian, Christianity had been in existence for about 30 years. And, um, and it, was at a, it was at or near its peak. There, it had never been better than it was at this time. People might have been getting to, to slip away. You know, they were beginning to get back into, into their old bad habits. And this chapter was designed to wake people up. They were getting cocky about being great at believing or great at operating this manifestation, this thing called Holy Spirit. They were, getting, they, were, they were getting so good at these things that they thought it was about them. No. Little word. Little word, big reason. And there are two Greek words that uh, define the word no. And they are, I'm going to spell them for you. They're real simple. Um, M E and O U, me and ooh, me and ooh. I don't know if that's exactly how you say it, but it's. Uh, but I will spell them when we get to them because I don't want you to think of me as me, and ooh as you. <laughs> so, uh, um, and these are small words with big meanings, and these words are going to point the direction of our of our mind. 
through, throughout this, the first part of this chapter. And it's, you'll, you'll see it. It'll make a big difference. And um, they point the direction of your heart. And the Greek word M-E is a no with a condition built into it. It's a no that depends. It depends. It's like saying, I suppose not. Now, is that a firm not? If you told your child that, what would they think? They would say yes, right? <laughs> you know, dad's going to give me the car tonight. <laughs> It's a possibility. That's what that word M-E means. Um, it's softer than the word O-U, which means absolutely, positively, unconditionally, no! <laughs> no way, Jose. Not going to do it. <laughs> you see, it's not going to happen. That kind of no, it just, there's no back and down. There's no change. It's just... No. And so we're going to see these two words. And then we're going to see a word. It's called charity in here, but it's the word love. And, um, and it's the Greek word agape. And uh, this is, a, it's got to remember, this is a Greek word, not a Christian word. Okay, now Christians always say it means the love of God. That is a definition of it, yes. But that's not what all the Greeks and the Romans understood this word to mean at the time of Paul. It wasn't a word he pulled out of, you know what? You see? I mean, this was uh, his hat. <laughs> that's right. <what> I... <laughs> Had to get myself out of that one. <laughs> you know? He did, I mean, this, is, this word agape, is, is a, it's a great love. You know, it, it does mean the love of God, but God loves us with, with, with that and phileo kind of love, it says. So, um, you know, it's an uncompromised love. It's uncut. It's pure. Not been stepped on. You see, it's like the word... Oh, you, it's absolute. Agape is not physical love, yet it leads into that space, if you know what I'm talking about, you see. Um, agape is not brotherly love, but, yet, but it sets up friendships and families for long-term success. Um, this chapter 13 will define love as well as the grit that it takes to really love for a lifetime. This is long-term love. This is what we want. And this is what other people want from us. So here we go. Um, now keep on the lookout for the words charity. Remember, charity doesn't mean giving away stuff to the poor. Charity just, it's this high love that's unconditional. There's no strings attached to this love. It's very hard to love like this, especially when you've been burned or you've been hurt a bunch of times. This is hard, but this is healing. This is a healing kind of love. This is a life-changing love. So look for charity. Look for the word not. Because the word not is that same word for no. It's an offshoot of, of either M-E or O-U. The word nothing will be in there or never. They're all from that same, they're, they're all a root or an offshoot of that, those words, either M-E or O-U. And also keep your eye open for these two words, faith and hope. And remember, faith is, is the word pistis. Now, some people translate that as believing, but others translate it as a conviction, a perseverance, you know, I'm, uh, I am not going to stop. It could be translated as grit and hope. Hope. That's you know it's going to happen. It's going to happen someday, and I'm heading in that direction. It's all training for the marathon, whatever your marathon is. It's all, it's everything that wrapped up that leads to that. That's love. So uh, here we go, verse 1 of chapter 13. Though I, and this is from the King James. Um, 
Though I speak with the tongues of men and of men and of angels, and have not charity, that's M E agape. So what kind of love is that? The M E? It's a conditional love, right? It has a it's it's sort of, you know, I don't think, you know, it's going to happen. You know, it's uh and have not charity. Uh, I'm become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So this is somebody who, who's good at, at, at talking in tongues, sp- speaking in tongues. A lot of you are. That's great, you see. But the point is, is it says if you do it without love, it says I'm become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Now, I know how to walk with power, but deep down, I'm not really sure I want to commit to loving the people around me. Right now, it's all about me. I want you to notice me. Nobody, no one's going to say that, but that's what this is saying. Paul saw this stuff going on. There'd be a whole line of people coming up wanting to, you know, to do this stuff instead of the people who were inspired. And then you'd look down on the people who didn't want to, you know. So, um, see, with, without um, unwavering and unconditional love, I'm just noise. I'm just static. You ever had somebody talk so much? I mean, they're, it's like they're all, and it's like pretty soon you don't even hear them anymore. It's just noise. It's just noise. And um, it says, it's like the blurting horn of a six-year-old that picked up his dad's old trumpet for the first time. Does that have a nice sound? Usually not. Or it's the sound from my next-door neighbor when they, every couple of times a year, they pick up the drums and they start hitting these cymbals. And I can hear them through their wall, across the, the yard, all the way through my wall and into my head, you know, and I hear I don't even know what they're doing. They're just crashing these cymbals, you know, but, but that's what it's talking about. That's how we sound. That's how we are. That's who we become. Just noise. We're just noise. Verse two, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith or believing or conviction so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, not again here is the conditional M-E, I am nothing. Now it changes. This word nothing is, is, is from that root word O-U. So now... Paul is saying, by revelation, he says, even if you're great at prophecy, even if you're great at, at receiving revelation, you understand things like no, like other people don't. You see, you know, even if you have the believing and the conviction and the grit and whatever it takes to, to move mountains, I am nothing. And this word nothing means nothing. Absolutely, positively, nothing. So you can do all these Christian Bible, cool old, you know, schnazzy things. And it's good if you do. You know, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, it, it, if we do that without, without that love, that unconditional love toward our brother man, We don't even exist. It's like we don't exist. You know, you know, I hadn't committed to fully loving, so I'm nothing. You see, here comes the, um, you know, that's, that's that word, that's that word, uh, um, OU, like I said. Basically, um, my spiritual accomplishments or my life accomplishment, accomplishments will sort of equal zero. Zip, nada, invisible. <clears throat> and now that's quite a thing to say to these, to other Christians, if you think about it. 
we read this and it's such a loving chapter. People read this all the time at weddings and, and such. But th this, is not, this is not complimentary, these first two verses. I mean, here, basically, if we don't walk in love, we're basically nothing. Because that's not the design of the human being. A human is designed to love. To love deeply. To love the unlovable. Jesus was that example. Look who he hugged. Lepers. Nobody wanted to touch a leper. Look what was on his team. I mean, you had tax collectors. You had people who hated the Romans. You had people who loved the Romans. You had fishermen. You had, I mean, he had all these people. He had, he had troops of people following him. They complained all the time. And they, they bantered and, and they bartered and they, and they bothered each other. And they, I mean, they're just, the apostles were some, were, were nut jobs at times, just like me, just like all of us, you know, but I mean, but he, he loved, look, I mean, look who, uh, Zacchaeus up in the tree, you know, I mean, he was hated. He said, come on down, dude. We're going to go to your house and have some, have a snack. And then most of the crowd turned away from Jesus at that time because they just wanted to see the, the freak show. You know, three people got healed. We'll get to that maybe in a couple of weeks. Um, so better keep reading here. And uh, though, here we go. No, oh, here's a good one. Verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. See, even if I d decide to give away everything I own, and trust me, there was people at, at this time that gave away everything to take care of people in the church, especially the earlier days of it. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, you know I'm, I'm still spiritually and humanly invisible. Again, I am nothing. I think that's the word OU again. And, you know, if you think about it, you know, if this person would sacrifice their life for another, in their heart they were still doing it for themselves because they wanted the legacy. You think, who would do that? Most people. Every politician, right? Whatever side you are, you're on, right? I mean, it's all about the legacy, and it's all about them. You, you've seen actors sometimes, or singers especially, they'll get up and they'll sing, and sometimes they sing to you, right? And it, like, it, it's, it, it feels good, and it changes you. And other times, you realize they're just singing for themselves. That's the difference. And you can tell pretty easily on, on, uh, with, with music, you can tell when they when they connect when they get you to connect to them, and then you can tell at times when they're just singing off the of ego. Well, that's sort of what this is saying. You know, um, sadly, those acts of kindness will profit me not even one tiny little bit if I didn't do it with the right heart. See, no heart, no grit, no grit, no love. See, love takes determination, perseverance, and maintaining sight on the future. See, it's not just about us right now. Think about all day long who you think about the most. It's you. Unless you're your mom, maybe. And you might think about your kids more. But, I mean, typically people's life is so wrapped around, around themselves. We're, just, we're raised like that. Our culture's like that. It's hard to break out of that. Well, that's what Paul's trying to say here. And then these believers had gotten so big for their own britches, they gave everything away, but it was still about them. They could speak in tongues, do prophecy, you know, receive word of knowledge, word of wisdom. They were great at this stuff, but it was still about them. They didn't rate. And Christians think they're the greatest people on earth. You see, we're the only ones who rate. Well, you know, verse, verse 4, charity, that love suffereth long and is kind. You know, to walk at that higher level of love, that well-decided, unconditional love towards others, it must first need to be 
patient. This is the first lesson here. This is, this is sort of the, uh, oh, let me see here. Yeah. You know, suffereth long can be translated never give up. Never give up. And to never quit is the definition of grit. Look at the people who climb Everest. You think that takes grit? I mean, it's so dang cold and windy and you're tired and there's no oxygen and they just, they just keep putting a step in front, step in front. The guys, I read these articles on these ultra marathoners. They do 100 miles or 150 miles and, and they, their whole body is depleted of glycogen. They have nothing left. And you know what they say that you do? You just keep putting one foot in front of the other until the finish line. They said your whole body hurts, everything hurts, but you just keep moving. That's grit. That's a good parent. You just keep parenting. You know, you keep it up. That's a husband. You just keep loving that wife. You know, I mean, it's, it's wild. There's a, um, there was a wiry young buck named Teddy Blue Abbott back in the uh, post-Civil War days. And the, when, you heard, when you see all these cowboy movies, these Western movies about the, the roundups, and they went down into Texas where, where, oh, where these longhorns had bred and flourished and, and uh, become a very strong breed of cattle. And nobody went after them for, for 400 years. They escaped from, they escaped from uh, the, the Spanish when they came. And then they just, they populated in the, in the mesquite groves of, of Texas. Now, if you ever try to walk through mesquite, you will know you did. Because it has these big thorns on it, and they'll tear you up. That's why they wore chaps when they would ride through these things. And these longhorns, I mean, they were amazing. And they had sort of uh, become their own uh, breed just through... Uh, survival of the fittest. And, uh, and so after the Civil War, the, our country was starving. And the Southerners were just shocked. And a lot of the people, you know, who had been, uh, now were freed slaves, they didn't know what to do, where to go. So a lot of them heard about the, these free cattle down in Texas. And they were all used to working hard. And every team, every team of drovers typically had about 12. And about half of those were white ex-Confederate soldiers. And then, and then usually there'd be three or four blacks, and there'd be a few Mexicans and an Indian. You know, and, uh, and it was just a, and, and there was no, it was all according to how good of a cowboy you were. It didn't matter the color at that time. So this had to be a crazy time. Had to be a crazy time. And and these young boys would go go there and they would and they would round them up. There'd be somebody who knew how to do this and they'd take them all the way up to a railhead in Kansas. And that's where all these wild west stories about Dodge Kansas and uh, Dodge City and you know, the OK Corral and all these kind of things, you know, uh, you know Bat Masterson and Wyatt Earp and uh, some of these, you know, people that are you think are mythical, but they weren't. And so these guys would, uh, this Teddy Blue Abbott was one of these guys, was one of these young men. And um, he, he said about the life of a cowboy, and I quote, if a storm come and the cattle started running, you'd hear that low rumbling noise along the ground. Then you'd jump, from your, jump for your horse and get out there in the lead, trying to head them and get them into a mill, a group. Before they scattered to hell and gone, it was riding at a dead run in the dark with cut banks and prairie dog holes all around you not knowing if the next jump would land you in a shallow grave. That's the life of a cowboy. Many a young man died in the 90 days they were out. 
They lived outside for three months. They, they wore the same pair of clothes, never changed their clothes for 90 days. They didn't have drink. There was no McDonald's. They drank out of the streams just like the cattle did. They probably ate the same thing over and over and over and over again. Unless you had a good cook. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, and these guys would risk their lives for cattle. That's grit. That's grit. You think a tornado ever came through? Oklahoma? They had to go through Oklahoma to get to Kansas. Texas, forget about it. You see, what about hailstorms? <laughs> There's no protection. I mean, just think. You know, what these guys had to do. They had grit. It's funny to, to know, but the cowboys, um, there's been cowboys since there was cows. Right? The Romans herded cattle. You know, the uh, Rottweiler was bred to herd cattle, you know, by the, by the Romans. You see? It's just a tough, strong dog. You see, I mean, it's, it's, it's well, but you don't think, you don't, when you think of a cowboy, you don't think of a, a Roman. You don't think of, of some Greek guy in a toga as a cowboy, yet they were. Do you know there was cowboys in Florida? There was cowboys, not like, the, when you think of cowboy, you think of the 10-gallon hat and the six-shooter and the, the belt and the chaps and the, and the high-heeled boots and, you know, with pointy toes, you think about a saddle you know, you think about the bedroll tied onto the back, you know, the lariat. You know, you th I mean, we have this image. Well, that's, that's, that's what we're taught. It was such a crazy time. And the, only, the cowboy period only went on for 20 years. Th then they built the railheads all the way into Texas. Once the railroad was there, you didn't need the cowboy anymore. The, true, the real cowboy. Or the ones that we think about and, and they wrote the songs. I mean, they would ride, they'd be out all night. Sometimes they'd be in the saddle for, for 24 hours. They'd work all day and then all night. And they would, they would sing a lot of the, the country songs. They would sing, sing to the cattle at night just to keep them calm. And then they would sing a verse and the guy on the other side of the, of the herd would sing. Now the herd wasn't like bunched up like this. It might've been scattered, spread out for miles. But the cattle typically are herd animals, and they're going to stay together. They're going to follow a lead cow, the matriarch of the, of the herd. But I guess enough on that. And uh, see, grit is that perseverance and passion that pushes us toward our goals. It's the greatest, and the greatest of which is love. You know, love is the only thing that causes us to exist. Grit puts us on the radar. And here's the do not try list. The do not try list. Don't try this at home. <laughs> now we're going to get to, into the, what I call the do not try list. Or you could call it the naughty list. N-O-T-T-Y. And, um, and each of these next eight knots, N-O-T-S, are the word O-U, which means what? absolute no absolute no no change into the mind and uh and these are grit breakers and love takers and like the do not fly list which you've all heard about these are the things that we shouldn't have packed if we intend to fly through life and find love to the destination of love i should have said See, here, charity envieth not. You see, charity, love, vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. See, envy is to burn with passion for what somebody else has. Don't do it. You see, vaunteth means to brag about yourself. It's all about me. Did you hear that teaching I did? You know, did you, you know, did you know that I did, the, you know, it's just, it's just to, to brag about yourself. Don't do it. Don't do it. And uh, puffed up 
is to be self-inflated. Self-inflated. You see, I, I want you to. No, I need you to think I'm better than I really am. Politicians. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> You know, I mean, you know, you see, you see athletes like that, you know, I mean, they'll get into an end zone and then they're slapping their self on the chest and it's all about them. They want people to come up and, and, uh, you know, and slap them five or jump up and down or do chest bumps. You know, it's all about them. You see, puffed up, self-inflated. Here we are, doth not behave itself unseemly seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. See, unseemly is to be shapeless. A waffler. You know what the term waffle means? You just go back and forth on your decisions. It's two-faced. You ever met anybody who's two-faced? They'll tell you one thing and then tell you another thing and they'll talk about you behind your back and they love you to your face and all that stuff. None of you have any co-workers like that. <laughs> you know, shapeless. See, stand for something or you're going to fall for everything. Seek not her own. It tells us that love is, just, is never just for ourself. Love is meant to be shared. It's not about me, it's about we. You know, not easily provoked. And that means it means it's not easy to get agitated. You just absolutely don't allow it anymore. You see, it should take a lot to get us stirred up. This the world trains us to be like that. Maybe genetically we have a little bit more of you know fire inside. And that's okay, but you gotta control it. But these are the things. You, d you don't waffle. Make your mind up. Say yes or yes. You want it to be hot or cold. Commit yourself to something. And if you're wrong, what do you do? Change. Change. See, a lot of, a lot of Americans, um, their kids, we don't, we don't let them fail. And they don't know failure. They get a, they get a trophy whether they win or lose. You see, you get, I mean, some teams don't even have scores up to before a certain age. They don't know. The kids seem to know who won, oh, yeah. but they're not supposed to talk about it. Shh. You see? I mean, it's a crazy way to live. You know, you don't let your kid, I mean, I see moms hovering around their kids when they're playing outside because they, they, they don't want them to fall down. I saw a kid at the airport the other day, this little kid about the size of my shoe, it was walking along and, and it was falling down on its head and, and the mom would just wait and the kid would get back up and do a little cry and then the and then but she didn't baby it. I remember one time seeing I was driving out Highway 24 and I saw this whole herd of buffalo just rumble across this field through this open gate across Highway 9 and into the uh, into an, an adjacent field. Who the rancher owns both sides. And uh, and then this little tiny baby buffalo was running, and it missed the gate, and it tried to go right through the barbed wire. And it got stuck. Its hair was all tangled up in the barbed wire. And there was a guy on a four-wheeler just sitting there, laying in there, smoking his cigarette, watching this whole thing. And, uh, and, I, and I, was, I stopped, too, because <laughs> I'd never seen a herd of buffalo run like that before. And... Uh, and so I was watching, I thought, go, go help that little thing. Of course, a little buffalo isn't that little either. You know, so, but I mean, it just, he was just struggling and, and moving and, and, you know, and then, and, and I thought, this is, and he looked like he was getting more and more tangled in the wire. And I couldn't figure out why that rancher or that ranch hand wouldn't go help it. And then all of a sudden the, the little thing ripped loose and, you know, pulled some of its hair out, and then it ran through the gate. Why did the guy do that? It'll learn. Go through the gate. <laughs> Stay away from the wire. You know, sometimes, you know, you're going to fail. 
Our children are going to fail at times. They're going to get hurt. Now, we don't want them to, but it's going to happen. And we have to learn to deal with this stuff. That's grit. It's going to rain on you. It's going to hail on you. You're going to get bonked in the head. You're going to fall off the horse. Things are going to happen. But you get up, you brush off, and go for it. That's grit. That's love. Look at, look at what it's telling you here. It's not about you. Um, so not easily agitated. And uh, then thinketh no evil. And that's an amazing phrase. I mean, how do you not do that? I remember when I lived in Japan and we went to a shrine in Nikko. And that's where they have those monkeys. The see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil monkeys. And I remember seeing that, and I thought, that's, that's crazy. And I remember thinking about that as a kid, and I think, well, you can't help yourself from hearing evil, can you? You're going to hear it. You see, you can't help yourself from seeing evil. You're going to see it if you're alive and you have eyes and you're not blind, right? But you can keep yourself from speaking it. That's the one thing you can control. The rest of it you have to process. Thinketh no evil. And the word thinketh means to calculate or to, or to inventory or to stack on shelves, you might think. To estimate, like you're doing an estimate on a, on a, on a job. You don't estimate evil. And that word evil means harm. You ever done that in your mind? I have, where somebody's burned you and you think, Man, I'm, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And you start picturing all this crazy stuff. And then pretty soon I have to tell myself, stop it. <laughs> you know, that's dangerous thinking. It's when people let that stuff run wild is when they do the crazy stuff. Thinketh no evil. You don't, you, we don't even allow ourselves to stack up the negative thoughts about hurting somebody else. And this, is, this was written to believers, to Christians, to people who should know better, which means some of them were thinking how they could burn somebody else. You ever want to build a case against somebody? That's what this is talking about. We don't build cases. You just love. You ever had to talk yourself down? <laughs> I have. You see, love is like the lawmen of the Wild West. Like I mentioned, Wyatt and Bat Masterson, Masterson Wild Bill Hickok, Hiccup, you know. And, uh, you know, they were hired to keep the peace. We're hired to keep the love. That's why you're on earth. You're the peacekeeper, the love keeper. Verse 6, rejoice not in iniquity but rejoice in the truth. To rejoice in iniquity means to be cheerful or happy when somebody else is treated unjustly or wrongly. It's hard not to do that, especially if you don't like that person. And then something bad happens. Oh, they deserve it. Hey, that's what this is talking about. They don't deserve it. <clears throat> you know, we don't rejoice even when they do deserve it. You see, you know, this uh, rejoice, and this is interesting, it means, it's, it's, it means to be impersonal, impersonal. Um, in other words, it's like uh, I once had this Italian landlord, and he was trying to, to burn Josephine and I out of, a, out of a, a deposit. And we were arguing with him, and, and then he just wouldn't bend. He would not give us back our money. And he goes, hey, nothing personal. It's just business. Nothing personal. It's just business. You know, and, and that's, what this, that re, this, uh, that's what that word, that's what that kind of rejoicing is. It, it's, it's, a, it's a impersonal. It's just, it's, it's not, there's nothing to it. It's not, not the kind of rejoicing like you're, you really think of, you see. And... Uh, you know, and this ends this do not try list and begins our to try list. 
or our to-do list. Now here is here is how now we're ramping up. Here's what not to do because a lot of times you got to know what you shouldn't do. I'm not going to go back through those eight things. You can if you'd like. Now we're going to talk about four or five things that of what we're supposed to do. And uh, and and this is what love is. This is what we should put all our energy into being. This is what truly will give us the the grit so that we can we can really obtain this love. And here, this word, the end of that verse six is the word rejoice again. It's not the same Greek word, same English word, and it means to be totally connected and happily involved in what is true. Totally connected, totally immersed in truth. And it's being present. It's being fully present as you think the truth. You totally are, you, you're thinking about what you're thinking about. You're present within yourself. And you're present when you're with somebody else. You ever ha- been talking to somebody and they're like, and, and you know they're not listening to words you're saying. My wife gets this from me all the time. <laughs> She's talking to me. <laughs> Sometimes I can be watching a show, and I can't even hear her. She goes, Mark, why, the priest said I hear, I hear something. <laughs> and then I realized, oh, she's talking to me. I was so engrossed in whatever show that I couldn't even hear her. Um, but we, we need to be present. We need to be present. That's that rejoicing. And um, fully aware. And verse 7, believeth all things, or beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. And these all things, it's not talking about you, you you know, you're gullible, you know, like, you know, you know, it's not, you're not getting fished, you know, you're not a fish, you know, you're not gullible like that. Uh, We'll get to what that means in a minute, but here here this word beareth, uh, the word beareth means to put a roof over. Which would indicate what? Protection. Protection. Love covers. Love puts a roof on. All things means the whole enchilada. Everything you are and everything that you do. We protect, we fully believe, and we never faint as we hang on to whatever hope. We endure. And that word endure means to stay under. And it's weird. It's, it's, it's underneath. It's the foundation. It's the root system of that roof. You see, he beareth all things. You put a roof on it. You believe it. You guys know what the word believe means. You know, we hope with all things. Think you understand what, what hope is. And endureth all things. And I love that. It's like, it's like the, the lid. It's, you're just totally surrounded, you know, by, by this love. And, uh, you know, from the bottom to the top, we surround ourselves with love. That takes grit. That's not easy to do. That's all day, every day, from the moment you get up to the moment you go to bed. You think love. You control ourselves. Uh, Verse 8, charity never faileth. And this is that one last verse where the word no is in. And which which no do you think this is, M-E or O-U? Oh, you, it absolutely, positively will never, ever fail us. Love can't fail. It's not even a possibility of failure. You know, imagine the impact of our lives. Uh, if we can really walk with, at this level of love, will we make a difference? I guarantee we'll make a difference. Would you wives like to be loved by your husband with that kind of love and vice versa? Yeah. Would you would you parents like to be loved by your children with that kind of love and vice versa? Sure. We all want that. Friends. What kind of friendship would you have? There, whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Well, when? That's after the, the gathering together. You're not going to need them anymore. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. You're not going to need to talk in, in those tongues at that time. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. It's not talking about all knowledge. You're not going to need revelation the same then. 
You see, verse 9, uh, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. You know, we're never going to see it all, folks. We're never going to see it all. Keep moving. Keep loving. Verse 10, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. See, this is full-on hope. This is knowing it will, it will be awesome for us forever. If your life has been hailed on, rained on, hurt, whatever's happened to you, whatever you've gone through, you know, this, this is, we have the covering, we have the foundation. Love takes care of every part of us. You see, and, uh, and when, when, but someday the hope is that we will be perfect. We'll never have the problems like that again. It's going to be crazy good, crazy good. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. See, to not walk in love is childish. Now, children think about who the most? Themselves. And then we carry that into adulthood. It's all about me, all about me, all about what I want. All of it. And that's not life at all. That's zero. You're a zero if that, you're that way. That's selfish kind of living. That's not love. Love is living outside yourself. Living bigger than yourself. It takes a lot of grit to walk in love. You know, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. For now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I also am known. The things you've always wanted to know or needed to know, you're going to know. You only catch a little glimpse of what life is really about. We don't even understand ourselves. And then we think we can understand others? <laughs> Good luck! But this tells us how to deal with others. And the analogy of the glass here, you know what a glass is here? It's a mirror. Now, did they have mirrors? No. It was just a shiny piece of metal. Now, can you really see yourself in a shiny piece of metal real clearly, typically? Did you know until the 13th century, nobody knew what they looked like? Imagine not ever, there's no selfies. There's no home videos with those big cameras like you used to carry on your shoulder around the soccer field, you know. I mean, there's, there's none of those. There, there's nothing. There's no, nobody, Jesus did not know what he looked like. Paul, when he saw himself in the future, I wonder if he could even recognize himself. <laughs> Might have had to have a name tag. <laughs> you know, I mean, just think. Now, would your self-image be different if, if you had no idea what you look like? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Because what do little girls have such trouble with now? They try to compare themselves with Barbie or all these Victoria's Secret models or, you know, whatever. It's hard. Imagine if you didn't know. You knew what you looked like from here down, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you can see your shoulders. Never. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face, it's wild. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, believing, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now, you, to train yourself, to train yourself to, to have grit and to walk in love, you might want to think, just do one extra thing this week. Write a card to somebody. Send a couple of texts out. Call that person you've been thinking about calling. When you're in the weight room, do one more rep. When you're at the table, take one less bite. <laughs> you know, have one less drink or one more drink, whatever you, you, you need. You see, I mean, try, just tr do something and then be consistent and faithful with it. And that's how you train yourself. It's self-control. Love is self-control. You know, clean your desk off every day this week until it's a habit. 
my wife's over here telling me what I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> yes, dear. <laughs> you know, uh, do something important or, or creative or, or interesting every, every day. Do something. Train yourself to have this grit. Now, like, like I said, you know, grit has been studied by so many people. Here's, here's to, to wrap this up, grit, grit is continuing to go for it when the going gets tough. Grit is the ability to rebound from failures. Grit is, the, is being innovative. It's thinking outside the box. Grit is being tenacious, determined, unwavering. And there's sort of an acronym here for you acronym lovers. G, go for it. R, rebound. I, be innovative. T, be tenacious. You see, and 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that the fully walk in love takes grit. God bless.